From a gaming perspective, CPUs can seem boring. The old rule of thumb was that an i5 was good enough for games, and whether that i5 or equivalent had 4, 6 or 16 threads. That's been mostly true for over a decade. The thing is, the last few years have been really exciting in CPUs, with Zen 4 and Raptor Lake pushing the performance envelope, as well as the price. Why should you care? Well, because it means that previous gen products are now not only pretty cheap, they're also really bloody good. The Ryzen 7 5700X was a late launch for the AM4 socket, coming just a few months before AM5. It's not hard to explain why it exists though, old technology doesn't magically disappear once new tech replaces it, and a cut price 8 core using less well binned silicon is a shrewd way of clearing out the warehouses and helping shift some of the leftover A520, B550 and X570 chipsets. Plus, as attractive as Zen 4's IPC gains are on paper, AMD's focus on the mid to high end leaves a big price gap at the entry level. A gap which the 5700X can help fill quite nicely. In the UK right now, it sells for about £155, which for context is about £40 less than a modern locked i5, £55 less than the cheapest of AMD's Zen 4 CPUs, and a massive £135 less than the highly regarded, but still previous gen, 5800X 3D. Compared to those chips, it will lack a little in terms of performance, and of course it can't be understated that buying into AM4 now is effectively getting on board a sinking ship, at least as far as future proofing is concerned. Plus, for sub 144Hz gaming, it might still be overkill. If you're not adverse to buying into obsolete systems, the i5 10400F or Ryzen 5 5600 might be all you need, and are even cheaper. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The Ryzen 7 5700X is a Zen 3 based chip built on 7nm lithography with an ostensible 65W TDP and turbo up to 4.6GHz. However, with a couple of clicks in the Ryzen Master software, I enabled PPO and Curve Optimizer, which saw single core speeds of up to 4.75 GHz in synthetic stress tests, and all core clocks of about 4.5, but in gaming workloads they seem to stabilise around 4.65 GHz. These clocks did require a fair amount of cooling however, I used a 280mm NZXT Kraken AIO, and still regularly saw temps in the mid 80s. The rest of the test platform is… well, it's my editing rig. The 5700X has been sitting in my very pretty but somewhat airflow deficient Fantex Evolve case for a while now, situated on an ASUS Tough B550M Plus motherboard and paired with two sticks of Corsair Don Platt clocked at 3600CL16. The GPU is my Radeon RX 6900 XT, which I purchased specifically because of its ability to get more out of weaker CPUs but for the purposes of this test, is actually, if anything, a little underpowered. I usually start my CPU reviews with the eSports titles, as they're the ones with the big numbers, but I wanted to talk first about Starfield. It's no secret that Bethesda's latest title is very demanding on hardware, some might say unreasonably so. However, the latest beta update improves CPU performance. My test run is a quick walk through the mast district of New Atlantis, and up till now, most CPUs I've tested have struggled to maintain a constant 60fps. The 5700X is up to the challenge by a big margin. The average hits 83fps, with 1% lows of 57 pooping the party a little. Still, this is the best I've seen in Starfield so far. I went back and retested the 6 core Ryzen 5 5600X and it scored 75 FPS, about 10% higher than the non beta test run and about 10% lower than the 5700X. <music> 
testing Cyberpunk required a small change in methodology. The non-RT run is almost entirely CPU limited, though GPU utilisation did get up into the 90% range while passing over the bridge. This still meant for a small but measurable 11% benefit over the 6 core 5600X at 124 FPS on average and essentially equal 1% and 0.1% lows. The RT run, however, required a bit more upscaling than I usually use. Alas, it's hard to benchmark RT titles with an RX 6900 XC, especially with higher performance CPUs. At 1080 RT Ultra with FSR quality, the 5700X is only beating the 5600X by a measly 3 frames, averaging under 65 FPS. Turning FSR up to ultra performance helps, but is still occasionally running the GPU in the mid-90s, so while its average does climb to 71 FPS, you might find this chip can actually go a little higher with a more capable RTX car like a 3090 series. The same was true for The Last of Us. Despite CPU utilisation being extremely high, my usual test at 1080 high could be held back slightly by the GPU at times, resulting in a 115 FPS average that's just under 4 frames faster than the 6 core model. Running again, this time at medium and with FSR quality enabled, brought things further away from the GPU limit and saw the average climb to 128 FPS making the 5700X only about 8 frames faster than the 6 core 5600X at the same settings. I admit, I'd hoped for better from Jedi Survivor, as it's a game that's desperately seeking something to iron out the stutters, and it looks like the developers have zero interest in helping out further. The game does leverage the extra threads, to a degree, but it doesn't result in any greater performance. It scores exactly the same average of 114.5 FPS as the 5600X did. 1% lows were a couple of frames lower in fact, though 0.1% were a couple of frames higher and neither results in a perfect experience. Now you might think that this is the sign of a GPU bottleneck, so to be sure, I ran with Performance FSR, which improved the average by one whole frame. At my usual settings, Microsoft Flight Sim isn't particularly taxing on the RX 6900 XT, usually only needing about 60-75% to of the GPU to keep the CPUs fed. However, in the light of how the 5700X has been performing so far, I dropped from 1440p to 1080p to be on the safe side. This actually didn't help at all. The GPU is still only being partly utilised, and the CPU isn't capped out either, but nevertheless, the sim only runs at a roughly 74 FPS average, about on par with the 5600X. Coming back to the eSports titles, Valorant just isn't a game which needs an 8-core CPU. Its DX11 API, small levels and lack of any AI-controlled NPCs means it only uses a couple of threads and is hyper-focused on moving frames to your eyeballs. As such, it scores pretty much the same as the 5600X, averaging a whopping 516 FPS. 1% 1 and 0.1% lows were significantly lower on the 5700X, but not by enough to affect gameplay. This performance drop is either down to the lower clocks, or my having an absolutely atrocious night and getting murdered constantly. Just a reminder folks, super high FPS can't compensate for skill issues. The recent OG update to Fortnite has obliterated my previous test results by being massively higher performing than before, and so far I've only had the opportunity to revisit a couple of chips since then. In performance mode, Fortnite is running in DX11, so at the end of the day it's still all about the clocks, cache and IPC, and less so about core counts. The 5700X averages 451 FPS, while the slightly higher clocked 5600X, which I revisited using the replay feature to make sure the scene was exactly the same, scored 20 FPS higher. Of course, when we're talking numbers above 500, a 20 FPS difference isn't quite as big as it sounds, and you certainly wouldn't notice in gameplay. Counter-Strike 2 is another single-thread focused game, meaning the 5700X is still scarcely worth picking over a 5600X. 
The average FPS is 317, which, while excellent, is within a couple of frames of the cheaper 6-core, while the 1% and 0.1% lows actually fall a little lower on the 8-core CPU. Again, it could be the clock speeds, or it could be, you know, all the dying. Warzone gave me a headache. Alone among all the tests, including synthetics and productivity, it was the only one that didn't like the overclock. At all. Every attempt at automatic or manual overclocking caused a hard crash. Despite the game running in DX12 and therefore capable of leveraging all 8 cores and 16 threads, its 138 FPS average at stock clocks and 1440 basic was essentially the same as the 5600X. Dropping to 1080p did about nothing at all. In fact, the average dropped slightly, which is all part of the fun when trying to benchmark Battle Royale games. <sighs> Civ 6's AI turn time benchmark isn't all that fussed about the number of threads you have on your CPU, but it clearly counts for something. Despite not having a clock or cache advantage over the 5600X, it still completed the benchmark in an average of 6.11 seconds per turn, 0.15 seconds faster than the 5600X. This makes the 5600X the fastest chip I've tested in Civ 6 so far. In DaVinci Resolve, my 5 minute 4K H.264 render completed in 11 minutes 43 seconds. This is over 4 minutes 20 faster than the 5600X completed the same test, and over 10 minutes faster than an 8 core Haswell Xeon. As impressive as this is, the next generation of CPUs is even more so. My only experience with Zen 4 so far is a Ryzen 7 7840HS mobile chip in a very thermally constrained mini PC. So, the fact that this new chip can beat the liquid-cooled 5700X by almost a minute is very impressive. It's a similar picture in Blender. The 5700X finishes Classroom in 6 minutes 13, almost 2 minutes faster than the 5600X, and more than twice as fast as the Haswell EP Xeon. But the new generation has something to prove. The 7840HS beats the 5700X by 21 seconds, and I can't wait to see how the desktop chips perform. I went into this test with some preconceptions about how the 5700X would perform. In a weird way, I think I expected more, especially in terms of 1% and 0.1% lows, and I'm sad to say this doesn't appear to be the case. That being said, in terms of average FPS, modern CPU-heavy AAA games make a strong case for getting this over the 5600X or the near-identical 5600, which in the past would have been my go-to recommendations for lower-priced brand-new gaming CPUs. If you're looking for something that can keep up with a higher-performing GPU, either now or in the future, I think the £30 to £40 premium for the 8-core is a no-brainer. With all that said, the second generation of AM5 CPUs is surely not far off now, and there's a chance we might see some discounts on the Ryzen 7000 series. And even if that doesn't happen, the asking price of a 5700X is just creeping into the price range of the very cheapest Zen 4 chips. While that does mean potentially forking out more money on a more expensive motherboard and DDR5 RAM, the overall benefit to performance and longer lifespan for the platform might be worth it. Next year I plan on picking myself up a B650 board, and I already have my Ryzen 5 7500F on order, a rare chip to find in the West, and one which could be a contender for the best sub £150 gaming CPU on the market. Keep an eye out for that video in January or February. In the meantime, I have one more 8 core to look at before the end of the year, this time from Intel. Until then, thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.